for me a big pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Nikita Tsai, uh, our guest in the Helopetsky series. Uh, Nikita is a, a contemporary art curator and a chief curator of uh, Times Museum in Kvanchu. Um, and uh, today she will uh, present us a lecture called Where is the Dragon Boat Going? Very poetic um, title um, uh, over the curious um, about the lecture. And just to inform you about the structure, um, Nikita will uh, present uh, for uh, like uh, around 45 minutes uh, long documentary uh, film. Uh, then she will have a, a short lecture and then um, another short um, art video, um, 15 minutes. And after this, uh, there will be space for questions and, and discussion. Um, I'd like to also ask uh, thanks to uh, Transit and Display um, uh, with uh, support of Display. We are now uh, <laughs> we are now uh, presenting this this event uh, because, as you know, Cafe Kolbatsky is a, a nomadic series of uh, events, and we really believe uh, this this partnership to continue in the future. Thanks for coming. Thank you uh, for uh, Teresa to uh, introduce me. So um, I will start from uh, actually this first image I prepared for the presentation. And this is an image from the very first group exhibition of Times Museum from a Puerto Rico artist called Rosanna Perez. I don't know uh, Spanish. I probably knew the least Spanish in our South America team. <laughs> so, but it can be literally, I mean, the, the Spanish in this piece are translated as riding the horse out with my barefoot back. And I really, I like uh, the really uh, poetic implication of this sentence uh, because it's the perfect metaphor for the current bubble of contemporary art in China. And it summarizes what I would like to present for today. The sentence also reminds me of how I met Karina, <laughs> thanks to whom uh, I'm here today in, um, and, and presenting what I think might be interesting for, uh, for the audience here. Uh, we met in this trip to South America and we did these crazy visits and parties with six other curators. So, uh, thank you, and thank you for the hospitality of the team. And in, the, in today's presentation, I will go through, um, I will first show um, a documentary, a 48 minutes uh, documentary titled From, uh, from Jean-Paul Sat to Theresa Tang, uh, Contemporary Cantonese Art from 1980 to 1990. And it is in courtesy of Asia Art Archive, which is uh, quite an important uh, archival institution in Hong Kong. And after the documentary, I will go through a few cases from the early 85 uh, movements until now, and which will track artistic gesture of institutional critique in withdrawal regarding the paradoxical concept of art autonomy in modernism. And artistic autonomy originated from the Western context and art history was mediated yet transformed by the emergence of art market in China since the 1990s. So after all these cases and after the documentary, I will revisit two exhibitions I've curated and developed in Times Museum, cover two respective periods of modernism and modernization process in China, which will be the 1930s and the 1990s. And there are interesting resonances between these two distinct uh, decades and artistic discourse, institutional practice in the contemporary milieu of China are still preoccupied with questions brought up by this earlier generation of artists and intellectuals. So let's start with this documentary and you will probably have a better idea of what
也有理想，呃，但是无知。我很希望这个第一次的这个实验者，我称之为实验者，就希望他应该是一个一个全新的一个视觉经验，而不是简单的一个我们很曾经很熟悉的这种方式相信冇一個人會滿意再繼續受呢種呢種咁嘅程式嘅限制。我想喺藝術方面亦都有一種好共同嘅地方，係咁啊。以前我們的文化、這環境、社會都是一個目的性很強的社會，就你做這個，但是為了什麼？但是香港文化給我告訴我們，就說你，你做這個就是為了你的生活，啊，就是你活在這裡，你的藝術什麼就是為了活在這裡。呢種係一種健康力量嚟，我覺得。佢真係從生活嗰個嚟，又返返生活。你話佢有就有，你話佢冇就冇㗎啦。我覺得藝術不是說像像插圖那樣去解釋一個哲學的道理，而是說這種東西怎麼樣通過引起你的思考而融入到你的藝術裡面去。我覺得嘛，受影響大的是西方的西方的現代哲學那一塊，應該說從像從。弗洛伊德嘛，到沙特啊，能拿到一本新潮文库，那就意味着就像今天能买到一件名牌衣服一样。<笑>那个时候跟现在不一样，那个时候如果一个学生在学校里他很深刻，他看了很多书，他就会变得很深刻，讲话都不一样了。然后那那如果你是个男生的话，就有很多女生追着你。嗰、那个时候系呢样嘢系啊，即系成个社会价值嗰个依赖。而家咧即系等于。你可以有好多好多嘢出嚟，但係而家出嚟嘅書係冇可能有咁嘅影響。So actually,、um, I, I was also born in、uh, Guangzhou and Canton and.、Um, In the, at the beginning of the documentary, they mentioned a year like 1976. That was also usually mentioned as the beginning of contemporary in China in general, and because that was actually approaching the end of Cultural Revolution, and uh, and kind of uh, became possible for artists to self-organize certain exhibitions in the public space and also in alternative venues. And I was also born, I mean, late 70s, so. All of this、uh, phenomenon and the translation of this、uh, publication literature and the transformation of the city and also this open policy and economic development was part of my childhood memory. But of course, this、uh, group of artists and critics, most of them born in the 50s, also middle of 60s. I still work with them and also Karina actually saw the exhibition of the retrospect of the Big Tail Elephant Group. And so, and I, I think today I, I'm being a little bit lazy, like showing this documentary helped me to show a, a kind of a general background of,、uh, of where I'm working, the context, uh, social, political, economical context that I'm working、uh, within. Okay. And, and so now we will be seeing more images after the 90s. And actually, this is,、um, as, this is、uh, as part of the seminar I organized、um, in、uh, 2013. It's titled Active Withdrawal Weak Institutionalism and the institu institu Institutionalization of Art Practice, sorry, co organized by me and Biliana. And this is a work by Zhang Guogu, who is also based in、uh, Canton, and he's living in a smaller town called Yangjiang. So he gave a presentation about his work and practice, and then he showed this、uh, picture of a poster hung on the outside wall of、uh, Yangjiang Group, which 
is an artist group that he uh, initiated with three other artists in Yangjiang, on which the slogan is called uh, 58 New Wave Big Steel Making. It was printed as a big poster outside of this uh, building. But this is actually the studio of Yangjiang Group. It looked like an eccentric museum building, and I think it looked quite global in a way. And um, he also mentioned the minor conflicts that he had with the local residents while the building was being constructed. So as well as the private and public activities uh, carried out by the Yangjiang group uh, in the studio was also kind of very much related to the vernacular uh, reality of Yangjiang. The double meaning of the year, 1958 and 1985, resonate the political history and art history of China. And the poster has adopted the aesthetic of the social socialist regime. This uh, poster has been presented in museum exhibitions uh, and including Guangdong Station and Guangdong Museum of Art in 2008 and Yangjiang Group Fuck Off the Rules in Mingsheng Art Museum of, China, of Shanghai in 2013. But Zheng Guogu has not tried to position his projects in the context of museums and exhibitions. He chose to continue living and working in Yangjiang a relatively affluent coastal town in Guangdong province, even though he is now recognized as one of the most acclaimed and contradictory Chinese artists of his generation. For him, to claim that the act of building a museum slash studio in Yangjiang as a critique against contemporary art institutions is to recognize the institutions as having provided the rules and laws that govern his artistic practice. So just like the title Fuck Off the Rules, he's not trying to change the general rules of art production and distribution, but to merge the two into one, to stay loyal to his vernacular life and preserve the aesthetic and social autonomy of art. And this is uh, another artist group that's not Uh, initiated, originated from Guangdong province, but it's from uh, Xiamen. And then this is uh, in November 1986. Uh, this group is called Xiamen Dada. And uh, the I mean, the leading figure of Xiamen Dada was Huang Yongping. He was also invited to participate in Magician de la Terre in 1989 in the Pompidou. And he, of course, is closely associate, associated with Ho Han Ru as well. Xiamen Dada burned a number of works of art in front of the Xiamen Cultural Palace as a performance. And in December of the same year, they exhibited Fang Junk in the Fujian Museum of Art. By, pre, by creating paradoxes of what art can be or cannot be, they challenged the ideology of the official art system. In 1988, Huang Yongping wrote a statement for the project, which titled Away from Art Museum, in which he states it firmly that the biggest limitation imposed on artists by art museum is that artists want to exhibit their intent and ambition in museums. He also specifically pointed out that to not bring the works to the exhibition is more a cost-effective decision than a special way to participate. The costly approach seems quite unrealistic nowadays due to the overall inflation in China. So this also points out the background. There is a lack of general uh, public funding of art in China until now. The approach we adopt this time may turn out to be an effective way for Chinese avant-garde art to survive. So from the above statement of Huang Yongping, uh, we can tell that his allusion to a general lack of funding of art can also be regarding, regarded as a conjuring up of a modern patronage or public funding system, which still doesn't exist nowadays. And he was absolutely conscious and self-explanatory of Xiamen Dada's exhibition strategies. It's a gesture to oppose the exhibition-making format that directly transfers the work made in studio to gallery space, which completely isolated the exhibits from their original context. 
Um, Wang Guangyi uh, called the Zhuhai Art Conference, which was also mentioned in the documentary before, in 1986, a group show of slides. This is actually uh, a sketch of the Xiamen Da Dan movement. And we'll move to, this is a painting by Wang Guangyi, who is the leading figure of the 85 New Wave, which uh, in the documentary they mentioned as a major northern avant-garde movement happening in the 80s. So you can see the uh, socialist uh, symbol, like um, uh, image from Cultural Revolution, and also a kind of pop-up adaptation of uh, this socialist realism uh, style. So Huang Yongping called this uh, conference a group show of slides. Yeah. And since more than a thousand slides documenting artists', artists works from all over the country were presented in this conference. With the conference signifying the local, local debut of a large-scale uh, contemporary exhibition, the act of showing slides could be understood as a gesture in Huang Yongping's words to not bring the works to the exhibition. In fact, Zhuhai Art Conference did propagate the birth and realization of modern art exhibition of China in 1989 in Beijing, which was documented as the first big scale uh, temporary exhibition hosted by a national museum in Chinese art history. Huang Yongping not only recognized the economic reasons for not being able to display the works, that means to transport the actual works were unaffordable for Chinese artists at that time, but also indicated the necessity of relating an artwork to its context. In accordance with Huang Yongping's idea, if artists can create works but have no control over how the works are distributed, either academically or commercially, they are forced to separate the relation between production and distribution, then the autonomy of art will be sabotaged. And throughout the history of institutional critique in the West, uh, museums, art institutions, and also the capitalist market have always been the main targets of attack. They are the biggest threats of the autonomy of art, while the just position between Huang Yongping's statement and Zhuhai Art Conference can show, can somehow provide entry of the following implication. The antagonistic relation between art institutions, art markets, and the artists cannot illustrate or explain the trajectory of contemporary art in China. From the 85 New Way movement through the beginning of the internationalization, such as uh, exhibition that curated by Ho Han Ru in early 2000, and also the uh, com commodification in the 1990s, until the complete taken over by market force after 2008. The production and distribution of contemporary in China respectively correspond to what Adorno described as aesthetic autonomy and social autonomy. Aesthetic autonomy stresses that art doesn't directly commit itself to any social or political function. Social autonomy designates art's functionless circulation in society. Aspects of some of these cases I present today shed light on how the legitimation of a contemporary art in China has been primarily driven by marketization. Sorry, there are a few pages. Uh, <laughs> it it needs to be emphasized that a uh, Zhuhai art conference that functions as a selection process for big scale uh, exhibition, it's not the only one, but also this kind of conference copied the official socialist hierarchical structure of that time in China. It is challenging for the critique of artists to go beyond their milieu as well as the dominating form of institutions. In some cases, their form of resistance adopted the intrusive power structure of the ideological mechanism they have been fighting against. The critique that Huang Yongping posed against the authority of museum displays was not targeted at the established institution of modern and contemporary art, but a protest against the denial refus refusal by the official art museums and institutions 
as well as a speculative gesture of uh, museums and institutions that will openly welcome works of contemporary art in the future. So um, at that time, artists were struggling to support themselves financially and also in the autonomous sense, and they were vulnerable as Huang Yongping's own professional life. Not until they got invited by this kind of uh, big scale exhibition such as uh, Magician de la Terre, uh, and also they actually uh, moved out of China after 1989, that they kind of acquire a self-sufficient uh, professional life as an artist. So he came in to realize that with, even with the awakening of the artistic self in a country that contemporary infrastructure were insufficient or even non-existent, it was impossible to talk about the autonomy of art. And the early sensitivity of Huang Yongping was later shared by most other Chinese artists. They knew they could continue working with minimum financial income and in an atmosphere of suppression, but whoever control art distrib distribution, such as like um, display, interpretation, and the marketing, and had the leverage of power. So I was showing this uh, image of the uh, Shanghai Biennale in 2012. Uh, the curatorial team from left to right was uh, Zhang Shongren, who is a very important art dealer since the uh, eight, late 80s and 90s. And also the second one was uh, uh, Chiu Zhijie, who is also the curator of uh, this year's uh, Chinese pavilion in Venice Biennale, and then Yangs Hoffman and Boris Goes. And yes, of course, uh, Shanghai Biennale was regarded as one of the main power station of uh, activating a contemporary art scene in China and also kind of becoming a main project for Shanghai government to promote the cultural image of international image of Shanghai city. So also some of the early arguments for uh, Chinese artists is uh, nowadays I can still pick up in the conversation of a uh, younger generation of chi uh, Chinese artists is called um, uh, content, content and language. So for most uh, Chinese artists, uh, it's a frequent topic in the 85 new wave but it's still a kind of ongoing conversation now. This is a kind of written a statement of Shu Qun, also one of the leading members of the 85 New Way and closely associated with Huang Guangyi, and wrote an article in the Chinese art newspaper in November 23rd, 1985, titled The Spirit of Northern Art Group in which he manifested the idea what the concept of art should be. So he said, we firmly against the so-called purified language of painting and the autonomy dictated by the specificities of the material. To our point of view, the primary standard of judging the value of a set of painting is to see whether they have manifested the genuine concept, which means whether they have manifested humans' rational power of will and the sublime quality and noble ideas of human beings. So you can read easily as a very modernist uh, concept uh, uh, of art, but that was written in the 80s. So this early avant-garde movement of Chinese artists, they were picked up actually what had been left behind or rejected during the Cultural Revolution, but it's actually a European modernism in the 30s. And, uh, and uh, one can, yeah, so it's, um, because also 85 New Wave was all usually read as a kind of political resistance against the ideological con control from the state and uh, the suppression. But in a way, uh, and also that was, that almost defined how a Chinese contemporary art was, is read today uh, through artists such as Ai Weiwei as a kind of political uh, dissident. But it was really not the case from the very beginning. Like they were really earn or urging or uh, for a certain kind of economical autonomy as well. Um, so after that, I mean, in the 90s, uh, changes happened quickly. 
And I, I, by revealing these cases, I am trying to offer entry to why this kind of complete marketization and commodification uh, of contemporary art in China happened in such a, a short period of time. And there is apparently not much uh, resistance uh, from within the, the, the system. So after the year of 1989, there was a discursive turn in the cultural arena and the avant-garde activities mostly went underground. So this is an image uh, you also picked up in the documentary of uh, Lin Yiling's uh, piece in 1995. It's called Safely Maneuvering Across uh, Lin He Rou. And um, so the, the shrinking of uh, arts public sphere, I think which happened a lot more in northern part of China, but actually Guangzhou had a relatively liberal atmosphere at that time. So um, the, um, they provide a certain kind of uh, the market emerge and provided a roundabout way for the legitimization of contemporary art, especially in the relatively developed and liberal south of China. There was the Guangzhou Biennial for Oil Painting in 1992, functioned actually as an art fair, and was one of these examples. According to its main organizer, Lu Peng, the purpose of the Biennial was to open up a legal path for art by leading the art to the market. That was uh, written directly by him in the statement. The market here was taken as a critical force against the ideological suppression. Since public funding that supports the production and exhibition making of contemporary art still does not exist today, and there is no systematic programming and collecting of contemporary art in most state-run museums, commodification of art is so far the most immediate tool for Chinese artists to realize economic autonomy and resist ideological control, even within the status quo. So uh, during an interview that I undertook with artist Xu Tan, a member of the Big Town Elephant Group, he talked about the reason why the several members of the Big Town Elephant Group uh, got together to organize their own exhibitions. <clears throat> Entering the 1990s, most artists realized that change on a state level would not happen overnight. And they turned their object of critique within the art system. In the 90s, the art economy had taken hold early in Guangdong province. Especially in the city of Guangzhou, young artists like those from the Big Tower Living Group managed to gain legal income from other occupations to support their own art production and to organize exhibitions. According to Xu Tan, he will save up his teaching fee to buy the production materials for his own works, which could mount up to 8,000 and 10,000 RMB per project, which is about a uh, 1,000 US dollars. While around that time, China's GDP per capita was only over 300 US dollars. So one might notice that economic development in southern China provided the artists with a um, certain level of uh, freedom. The Big Tail Elephant Group so solved the problem of art production and distribution by self-organizing exhibitions for the purpose of locating and securing possible venues for these exhibitions. They organized their activities in a similar way to those of a civil society by communicating and negotiating with property owners. The exhibitions and activities, their initiative was, were naturally intertwined with social relations that went beyond the art world. So this is an uh, installation view of uh, the retrospective of the Big Tail Elephant Group I curated in Times Museum uh, last year. And you can see like uh, this was uh, the documentary images of the actual performance in the 90s and this is how we present it in the uh, Times Museum which is uh, a very ch like wide cube and also challenging space uh, to work with. The Big Tail Elephant Working Group, aka um, Big Tail Elephants, comprised of the artists of uh, Chen Xiaoxiong, which was also interviewed in the documentary, but he, unfortunately, he passed away end of last year because of cancer. 
and Liang Chuhui passed away already in 2005. And Lin Yiling and Xu Tan is still very active um, as uh, also educator and contemporary artist. So they were active in the 1990s in Guangzhou, uh, the heart of the Po River Delta region. From 1996 to 1990, uh, 1991 to 1996, Big Tail Elephants self organized five exhibitions in temporary spaces that vary from cultural palaces, bars, to basement of uh, commercial buildings and outdoor venues. The decade from 1990 to 2000 saw the emergence of distinctive developments within the once peripheral contemporary art scene of the Pro River Delta region, which could in part be seen as a result of the combined forces of the explosive economic growth in China and throughout Asia, and the twin projects of modernization and urbanization, promoted in the guise of freedom and openness, globalization, commodity et economy, and consumerism deeply transformed the lives of ordinary people. Driven by the intense growth of economy and the desire for renewal of material life, an alternative model of modernization, neither Western nor Chinese, gradually took shape and came into reality. With witnessing and experiencing the complex set of realities, Big Tail Elephants strove for the autonomy and legitimacy of artists and artistic practices and developed a self-conscious mode of critique and resistance to the modernist binaries like West slash China, Central slash local, public slash private and avant-garde slash conservative. Big Tail Elephant's continuous activities and influence during the 90s play a positive role in the artistic environment of the region, illustrating that in spite of a lack of infrastructure and external support, creative forces and energies could still be nurtured. So this was a, a performance as well by Liang Zhuhui, titled One Hour Game. Uh, he executed in actually the developing uh, business center of Guangzhou. So you can already see probably from the documentary, the landscape of the city in the 80s and the landscape of the city in the 90s really changed uh, dramatic uh, transformation. And of course, nowadays, uh, this uh, region is full of high-rising uh, buildings and sky skyscrapers. And this was how we shown the piece in, uh, in the museum, because we have this uh, tiny elevator connected the muse museum entrance from the ground floor to our exhibition space. And one hour refers to the title of uh, the Big Tail Elephant retrospective is uh, called One Hour, No Room, Five Shows. So one hour refers to Liang Zhihui's piece and uh, enacted in the elevator of a construction site in Guangzhou and working directly in uh, public urban spaces. Uh, Big Tail Elephant proactively engaged with the ephemerality of artistic projects. No Room corresponds to the title of the group's uh, fourth exhibition in 1994, organized in uh, San Yu Ro, Guangzhou. The title No Room was suggested by Hou Han Ru at that time, who was in correspondence with this group of uh, young artists. The title indicates the um, institutions and spaces available for the display of contemporary in the 90s are actually uh, doesn't exist, while also uh, alluding to a guerrilla style spontaneity of the group's exhibition initiative. Five show highlights the five exhibitions organized by the group in non-art spaces in that period of time and the members of Big Tail Elephants were among the earliest to adopt conceptualist approach and introduce ideas of temporality, process, and immateriality into their practice. Exhibitions and sites of action were thought of as laboratories for the artistic experiments that brought art and everyday life, concept and medium, audience and artwork into constant interactions. The ideas materialized directly in the exhibition space and process paraded from streets to bar. Um, 
and also performances and works were open to participation and intervention of the street passerby. This fleeting events collapsed the hierarchical ordering of art and non art, elitism and street culture, and offer uh, insight into the social political context of contemporary in China during and after the 1990s. And it's pointed to a deliberate withdrawal from making distinctive political statement, which I call it uh, ideological kind of movement and continue until now. And you rarely find contemporary, I mean, younger generation of Chinese artists adopted the same kind of uh, language from the 85 new wave and making any kind of political uh, statement and uh, in, the, in the practice now. So this is also an installation shot of uh, Times Museum's uh, retrospective of the group. It's an archival wall of, uh, of all these uh, documentary images and publications and also some floor plans of their organized uh, exhibitions. And um, this uh, exhibition also then toured to Beijing and uh, we, uh, the exhibition space of Probably from these images, uh, you won't, you're not able to actually really see how the space uh, of Times Museum look like. And usually it's just a fancy white cube with a lot of uh, challenging windows and ceiling windows. And we kind of constructed a lot of this uh, wooden structure within the space, trying to in enact uh, this kind of underground atmosphere of the 90s. Otherwise, all this, when all of these uh, pieces, performances, temporary actions were kind of exhibited, display in the space, I think they just completely lost the uh, energy of, uh, of their time. And this was a particular moment in the 90s, and I think uh, um, entering the 2000, uh, the whole uh, art in the contemporary art industry uh, in China just oriented toward the market. And market took off in 2008, and uh, most of the private uh, museums, contemporary art museums, were set up around that period of time. And that led to also the opening of Times Museum as well, 2010, and UCCA in Beijing, 2008. And uh, you can also see from uh, my kind of review, it was really a relatively short history. And, and then that's why I uh, accepted this invitation from uh, Villa Vassalier in Paris to uh, research towards a case uh, related to a women artist uh, in the 30s. And it was actually also my first project to bridge uh, contemporary art with modernism uh, in, in the milieu of, uh, of Chinese art history. So, uh, and I will talk, um, this is the image of the, I mean, installation uh, shot of uh, the current, the exhibition in Mila Vassalia. Uh, open 20 of May last month. So uh, I will give a certain introduction of uh, the, the protagonist of this exhibition. Um, it's, uh, her name is Pan Yuliang. Uh, she was born in 1895 and she died in Paris in 1977. I also brought up this ex exhibition because if you remember uh, the interview of Xu Tan in the documentary, he mentioned that he, were only, he felt like he were only started to expose to Impressionism in the 90s when he was like a kid, really young. But of course, um, Chinese artists were not only ex exposed to Impressionism or European modernism that late. This generation, like Pan Yuliang's generation of artists who went abroad already in early 1920s and the 30s and the 40s, they were already informed of European modernism. And so I will um, give a little bit of background. So Pan Yuliang's career as a modernist artist and an art educator in the period of Republic China resonated with larger social political movements at that time from the cultural construct of new women and the new cultural movement to the revolution and reform launched by the Nationalist Party and early communists and the rise of modern nationalism in China. And from the end of World War I to the Japanese invasion in 1937. 
while many of her male peers and acquaintances with Western educational background advocated their social, political, and cultural visions in public and make their way into mainstream history, which among those actually at that time, this uh, early group of Chinese intellectuals, artists, uh, they, they, one group of them went to Japan and the other group went to Paris. So Deng Xiaoping and also uh, Zhou Enlai went to Paris almost the same period as Pan Yuliang. So they mediated the concept of modernis modernism through this kind of uh, um, um, education in the West. And also, I think the first edition of Communist Manifesto was translated from a Japanese edition. And, and yes, so many of her, pale, uh, her male peers, such as Xu Beihong, and when artists was mentioning uh, realism and later on social realism, realism was propagated by this early generation of Chinese artists and intellectual as really the face of modernism because for them, they, they were not interested in European modernism at that time. They were not interested in uh, painting or the canvases as the service because that was already exercised in traditional Chinese painting. They were interested in representing the world scientifically and with volume. So that was realism for them. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to also kind of build this cultural nationalism at that time, uh, representing the working class. And uh, so while many of her male peers and, uh, and they, they make into a mainstream history, Pan Yuliang's own accounts related to major decisions on her life and her artistic motivation are nowhere to be found. Pan Yuliang was a uh, because she was born in a relatively low, lower origin family. And then when she was around 14, she was, uh, her parents died and she was sold to a brothel by her uncle. And then she was bought out, bought out officially by, uh, by a nationalist uh, party officer, a liberal, and she married him as a concubine. And then uh, she applied for the first uh, group of women students of Shanghai Art Academy, and she got in because of the recommendation of her husband's uh, friend Chen Duxiu, who was the leading communist uh, figure at that time. So she was enrolled in Shanghai Art Academy in uh, 1919. And, uh, but then she was kind of forced to withdraw from the school, drop off, kind of because uh, people find out her background. So she uh, applied for the Lyon Chinese School <coughs> in 1920s and went to Lyon and then started in Bossa in 1920s. <coughs> and from her earlier paintings, you can find influence of Impressionism for sure, Orientalism. And I'm, I'm sorry, the images are a little bit small here. And you can see, um, this is a, a proposal by an art historian I invited as one of the four participants of this uh, research-based uh, project. And it was our first time to visualize her research, not by writing an essay or paper. And also because uh, during the process of research, we went to Shanghai, Nanjing, and also police station and the National uh, uh, Archive uh, in Paris. And but most of her, the uh, original documents of her archives are not accessible by us. And the biggest collection of Pan Yuliang's uh, work are uh, in Anhui Provincial Museum, which is a state-funded museum. But um, they will not offer uh, research. Uh, they're not having granted us uh, accessibility to the, uh, to the big collection and also the archive because state-funded museums don't work with a uh, private uh, museum in China. <laughs> so um, we actually cannot uh, loan any original archival documents and barely any works. So we developed this kind of uh, almost like a subjective uh, 
archival atlas of uh, Pan Yuliang's, uh, which also uh, kind of intervening our own subjectivity throughout the process of research. That's why the exhibition is titled A Journey to Silence, because uh, it's part of what we realize when we are trying to approach this subject or research subject of uh, women artists from that period of time. We found that it's, uh, she is drifting and running away from us all the time. So uh, besides uh, Mia, I also invited a young uh, painter who was born in 1983, studied in the uh, Art Academy in Hangzhou, and she's very uh, enthusiastic and loyal to the medium of painting, which is, which is kind of rare now for younger generation of Chinese artists. So uh, her proposal was to make, the, to reenact or reconstruct a certain women painter studio. In, in the exhibition uh, context. Because uh, during the, the um, she also makes certain new uh, painting uh, based on our research about Pan Yuliang. And then uh, we, and she is now moving from Hangzhou to Berlin. She just acquired a studio in Berlin and she's with, it's a kind of reenactment of Pan Yuliang's trajectory as an artist, as a woman, young, young woman decided to kind of uh, spend uh, part of her life in the West and also in China. And for uh, Hu Yun, he made a proposal of uh, uh, sound pieces uh, of uh, almost like uh, those uh, language application you can download from your iPhone, like a French uh, learning application. And then he, he make a certain kind of fictional narrative in the dialogue, the French uh, teaching dialogue, and uh, putting part of Pan Yuliang's uh, life, life story and trajectory into this narrative of the conversation. And then this is a video uh, developed by uh, Huang Jingyuan. Um, and um, as she is, uh, I, she is one of the few uh, women artists in China who manifested her feminist uh, idea openly and publicly. And uh, so I invited her to present a, a new work which kind of reflect on the kind of domestic tension uh, and also uh, antagonism within, between her and her father. Like her father was uh, kind of the generation that suffered from cultural revolution that he wanted to become an artist, but in the end, of course, he failed his own dream and he became a, a kind of a, what we call like a, uh, a painter working in a factory for propaganda um, kind of painting. So he, even then after his daughter became an artist and a woman painter and studied abroad, he, during the conversation of the video, you can still feel that he's not, not sure about a woman nowadays can, can be, can be self-sufficient and had a certain kind of decent social status by being uh, an artist. So uh, the art, uh, Huang Jingyuan was uh, watching all this uh, film of Pan Yuliang, documentary of Pan Yuliang, uh, looking at the publication of her and discussing about Pan Yuliang. But at the same time, it's, they're not discussing just uh, about Pan Yuliang, but women artists' uh, uh, situation in general in China. So go back to how, why I chose to work with this, um, I mean, Pan Yuliang, because Pan Yuliang, it's a very interesting uh, contracts between France and China. In, in France, almost no, not many people know about her at all. Um, Pompidou got a few of her painting in the collection, and another museum called Sanuji Museum, got some of uh, the collection, but uh, nobody knows much uh, about her and it's, she doesn't have a position in uh, French uh, art history. And she's very well known in China, not exactly because uh, from an uh, art, uh, uh, art historian perspective, but she, there is a film in the 90s, uh, Mixed uh, based on her life, uh, acted by a very famous actress uh, called Gong Li, and all and also there are documentaries and also there are novels written by Chinese uh, novelists and also I think one American novelist, 
And all of this uh, representation and narrative about her focus on the legend of her transform from, like title, you can, if you search her name on the internet, you can easily find essay article title called from prostitute to modernist painter, from uh, the red line to painting the world red, this kind of stereotype uh, representation of women. So I, by proposing to work with uh, Pan Yuliang, and Pan Yuliang was also captured in a photography archive uh, acquired by Pompidou. Uh, it's called the Mavo Archive. It's a photographer who was active in the uh, First World War and he took images and photos of artists uh, who have studio in the Montparnasse region. So they didn't know much about Pan Yuliang and they wanted, they have a list of artists also coming from over the world who own a studio in the Montparnasse, of course, beyond your, uh, beside Geometry and uh, Picasso, and then um, French art history, of course, doesn't offer a certain position. So I was invited as one of this researcher curator to produce knowledge uh, based on this archive. But they're now also inviting artists or curator from India, from Southeast Asia and from uh, Latvia, I think, to activate the uh, archival images. So, I, I hope I, it's uh, about 40 minutes. So I hope um, I'm done with the talking for the moment. I'm gonna show um, another video, a 40 minutes video from uh, Joe Tao, who is participating artist of uh, wellness this uh, when is Biennale this year? Zhou Tao is uh, an artist based in Guangzhou, and actually this uh, video he developed uh, partly from uh, Pan Yu, which is only a half an hour drive um, from Guangzhou. <clears throat> it's not a rural area, but you pro that he managed to find this group of uh, men that were practicing uh, dragon boats. In, in actually in, uh, I think Pan Yu also nowadays look at this very urbanized uh, area. And part of the video you might not be able to recognize in a shot, was shot in Paris in winter. So uh, part of uh, a bot botanic garden in Paris while he was doing his residency in, uh, in Cadiz uh, Foundation in Paris. So I'm showing this video partly to illustrate after this two decades of kind of an oppositional uh, statement, and now how uh, contemporary artists are working on this migration of ideas, artistic forms, and also uh, materiality in a, a more fluid way, and, and, um, and situated uh, kind of uh, Po River Delta region and the local kind of uh, 
geopolitical uh, context into uh, a global uh, milieu. And they, I mean, they rejected the previous generations of positional uh, kind of uh, gesture by kind of um, <clears throat> actively engaging in, um, in a more international kind of artistic production and uh, way of researching. Also, Zhou Tao was quite particular. Um, he developed very particular methodologies of working after his residency in Cadiz, and he was a lot of time almost like an animal, uh, like ambush, and he, he waited a long time for the scenes to come to him rather than um, actively creating uh, uh, or, or creating certain artificial uh, uh, cinematography and, and based on. He doesn't also, he usually doesn't do a lot in terms of uh, tuning the images and color after he shot the scenes. So um, a lot of his recent project, even in the, in the video you can see from Venice Biennale, was a kind of continue uh, activated also uh, by his, um, his own uh, kind of state of being um, a diaspora uh, on purpose and not really um, kind of sticking, sticking loyal to what the previous generation of art, his uh, student of Xu Tan. So, and because I, I don't think today we'll have enough time to kind of cover all the gap in between these projects and, and the kind of um, uh, history of uh, contemporary art. So I want to show the last, um, last pages of my presentation as to answer the question, where is the Dragon Ball going? And uh, so, where is the Dragon Ball going? Before offering my answer, I um, I show this video, and it's a perfect example about the shift from binary opposition and argument to global migration of ideas, forms, and materiality in relation to the vernacular perspective of the Po River Delta, where Times Museum is uh, situated in. And the Po River Delta as a constructed geographical division originated from the hydrographic integration of the Po River Delta and its distinctive regional traditions and indigenous culture. Since the late 1980s, the geocultural construct has served as the foundation for government um, planning of the core PRD, the greater PRD, and the pan PRD. Over the past two decades, the shared roots of local culture has been shaken and shifty, shifted by geopolitical changes and economic uh, reform. From the 1978 establishment of the first foreign invested three supply and one compensation enterprise in Human, to the more recent relocation of manufacturing and infrastructure investment from the PRD region to Southeast Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the global circulation of objects, people, capital, images, and ideas has profoundly modified the everyday life and cultural landscape of the PRD. Since its founding and opening in the end of 2010, this is uh, the image uh, actually before the museum officially opened. I was not working there when this image was captured. And uh, this uh, few, um, still existed at that time, and there is a family uh, working and living upon it. But this uh, few already disappear nowadays. Guangdong uh, Times Museum has been committed to research base and experimental and discursive projects. As a unique case in the urbanization process of the PRD, the museum designates its programming according to the history and the context of the region and devotes its programming to historicizing, presenting, and projecting the PRD's artistic practice in critical relation to globalized mechanism of cultural production and distribution. In, um, so Times Museum was part of the 
Guangzhou Triennial uh, Initiative by Ho Han Ru as well. So Guangdong Times Museum in 2017. So the yeah. so where is the Dragon Ball going? The answer is all the way south. <laughs> so we uh, we we're, we're launching uh, Operation PRD All the Way South Research Fund as a theoretical orientation and action action plan. Uh, Self-diasporic gesture of the PRD can be traced back to the 19th century immigration of Cantonese laborers to the south, southern regions and countries, including Southeast Asia and Cuba. In the period of colonial trail, it, it is also a critical response to today's global crisis of neoliberalism and neocolonialism. Northern countries as representative of modernity are still regarded as the center and canon of knowledge production and cultural constructs under the worldwide imperial condition, which continue to marginalize histories, experiences, and knowledge of the peripheral and the local. The emergence of Southern theory and social movements from Southern nation states have aimed precisely in ratifying such inequalities. Located on the southeast coast of China as an urban center of the PRD, the city of Guangzhou possesses many historical, cultural, and geopolitical attributes of the global south. Our commitment to the Southern turn does not intend to re reiterate the geographic division or social cultural hierarchy between the South and the North. Rather, it situates the museum in a rich and complex constellation of Southern narrative and imageries by focusing on artists, filmmakers, writers, scholars, and self-organized activities that negotiate between global capitalism and local forms of interpretation and res resistance. So it's a kind of... Uh, Open call we launched this year, um, and that will it will invite a project that engage with regional perspective of the Peruva Delta and the writing of local art history that in, intersect with the movement of globalization and historical research on the exchange and dialogue between China and other countries of the global south. Because China, the whole development of contemporary industry in China have always been looking upon and taking reference like from the West, mostly Europe and the States. And with regard to the circulation of artistic idea production and exhibition, project that challenge northern eccentric perspective and explore new networks of theoretical reflection and actions, project that develop critical responses to uh, and investigations of issues of colonialism nature, gender, class, and race under the framework of Southern theory. So um, that's where the Dragon Ball is going, <laughs> not the North, but the South. And that's the end of my presentation today. <laughs> Thank you.